Amen. Good morning, Andrews. Good morning, Andrews. Well, my name is Sandra, your AUSA president, and on behalf of the rest of the Week of Prayer team, I would like to welcome all of you to our first day of Week of Prayer and our first day of blessings to receive this week. I will kindly ask you all to stand with me as we open with prayer. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for the privilege we as your children have to be a part of this institution and the blessings we gain from being a part of it. One being that we come here to receive messages from our own peers, God. I don't know many places that have that. So I just want to thank you that we are alive and will be able to attend the, um, this occasion, Lord. And God, I'm praying that you will open our hearts so that this week will not just be one of those that we come just for credit or just because our friends are coming, but it will be one of those weeks that, God, we fight to find you. God, we fight to receive your messages. God, we fight to get closer to you, God. And God, as we fight, I pray that you, we will feel you closer to us, near us, that our hearts may be open wide to receive all these messages. And God, as we receive your blessing, that we'll be willing to pass it along. God, may we all be saved and um, go into your kingdom when you return. Thank you so much. Forgive us up, uh, of our sins and help us to live a life that bl brings glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Hey, Andrews University. Oh, that sounded nice. Well, you guys are so welcome to stand on your feet and worship God with us this morning. Why God? Why serve him? Because there's so much to love about him. And this morning, we're going to sing, Oh, How I Love with Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its words. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth.
It is such an awesome experience to have a relationship with God when you know that he loves you no matter what. And in return, you can give him your heart. And so this morning, we're going to sing of the power of his ever, never, ever unfailing love. powerful. Amen. 
Amen. He conquered death. Amazing. He can make us new. Crazy. And he gives us the strength to stand. Even when we feel like, oh, what's the point? Why do I have to change my identity to stand for Christ? It's in his strength that we do that. And we have eternal life in reward. And it's such a blessing. And so I invite you to thank God as we thank him for that gift. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure. for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul now to stand so what can I say and what can I do
Good morning, everyone. Um, just before I have a prayer, I want you guys to just turn to each other and pray um, with yourselves, you know. Uh, I want you guys to pray about this week of prayer. I want you to pray about what you think God has in store for you in the next coming weeks and months. And uh, in about a minute or so, I'll, I'll have prayer. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for life and giving us a chance to live it. And I pray that you uh, help us live it to our best. Um, thank you for the long weekend and uh, especially for what it stands for and um, for bringing us right into this week of spiritual emphasis. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, I pray, Lord, that during this week we take our time off to focus on you, to listen to your voice to find out what it is that you want us to do for you. Um, I pray for all of the speakers, especially for Vimbo this morning. 
that you speak through her, Lord. And uh, please bless us through her. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, Andrews University. I'd just like to thank everyone who's been praying for me, and I really appreciate it. I just want to let you know that. Um, let's actually begin with prayer. Dear God in heaven, right now I'm just asking you come and be with us. Lord, open our ears and open our hearts. In your holy name, amen. amen. Do any of you guys recognize this guy who's on the screen? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, for those of you guys who don't have your, raise, your hands raised, I know you're lying probably. But um, don't pretend like this because we're in chapel. You weren't listening to him five minutes ago. The man pictured here is, his name is Mr. Dwayne Michael Carter Jr. But most of you guys probably know him as Lil Wayne. He is a wildly successful rapper, and for those of you guys who don't know, his net worth is estimated at about $100 million, and that's like $100 million more than I have. But why is he this rich? Probably because he has successfully created a distinct identity within the music world, primarily rapping about his life, which apparently consists of getting money, getting girls, and getting high. In fact, he wants to leave a legacy with this identity that he's created. And as he puts it, as long as people remember me forever, that will be enough for me. But what is identity, guys? Well, my name is Vimbo Vivian Juan de Sarajo. And when I was young, I really, really, really wanted to be famous, and I still kind of do. But I used to watch TV, and I remember thinking, even from a young age, I was like, I am going to be the next Oprah. And it made so much sense to me because Oprah, listen to this, Oprah has five letters, and Bimbo has five letters. And so I figured when she retired, they would take down the O-P-R-A-H, and then they'd put up the V-I-M-B-O, but um, it hasn't happened yet. So we'll see what, what happens. But I figured if I wanted to be famous, I'd have to create an identity. And to create an identity, you have to do something. So I tried everything. Um, I did acting for Berrien Springs Middle School. Woo! Never got a lead role. The closest I came was I was like the lead character's mom one year, but that didn't pan out. So I realized, okay, acting is not the road to Oprah. That's okay. So I tried sports. But the thing is, I'm not very good at sports. And it's a wonder that they let me on the team. I think it's just because I smiled a lot. But um, needless to say, sports was not my avenue to Oprah either. But as I grew up, I realized that identity is a little bit different from what I had in mind. And it hit me one day when I was sitting in high school, um, and the teacher was going through the attendance sheet on the first day of class. She got to my name at the bottom of the list. She's like, Vimbo Juan de Sara. Oh, you're Sabu Cecil's little sister, aren't you? And you're Taku's little sister, too, because they're brother and sister. I was like, yes, I'm Busi and Taku's little sister, I guess. But it started to hit me as this happened over and over again in almost every one of my high school classes that my identity had less to do with the fact that I was like the lead character's mother in a play sometime, or the fact that I hit a volleyball or that I bounced a basketball, but it had more to do with who I was associated with. And that's what we're going to talk about today. My friends, our identity is not in what we do, but it's in who we know. So a while back, I was reading through my Bible, and I was reading through Revelation. I only got to chapter 5. But in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, there's this really exciting description of Jesus in heaven, and everyone's worshiping him. And in verse 5, Jesus is given this title. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I was sitting there and thinking, wow, Judah, that sounds familiar. I, I, hadn't read, I wasn't really, really familiar with the name, but I figured it was a person. So I flipped to the other side of the Bible, and I found Judah's story in Genesis chapter 38. Now, I was thinking in my mind, okay, this Judah story, man, he's associated with Jesus. Like, Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He must have a really, really exciting story. He must be a really great person. He must have never sinned. But the funny thing is, I was completely wrong. And that's what I'm going to share with you guys today, the story of Judah. Now, Judah was one of Jacob's 12 sons. 
And if you guys remember, a lot of us are probably more familiar with Joseph. We make movies out of him and plays out of him. But Judah was another one of Jacob's sons. And he was one of the jealous brothers who didn't like Joseph. And so we're told of the story that you guys might be familiar with. One day Joseph goes to visit his brothers, Judah and the others in the field. And his brothers plot to kill him. And they're getting ready to kill him. And then Reuben's like, okay, let's not kill Joseph, you know. And then later... As he's sitting there and they're trying to decide what to do with Joseph, Judah is actually the one who sits there and he's like, you know what, let's not kill Joseph, let's sell him. Because there was people walking by and so they sold Joseph to be a slave. Now, when they go back to their father and they take Joseph's robe and they put blood on it and they make up this story, they're like, dad, Jacob, Joseph is dead, like, you know, and and I don't know what they were expecting their father's reaction to be. But what the Bible tells us in Genesis 37 is that their father was so sad. He was inconsolable. He mourned for days. And so it's with this background that we are inserted Judah's story in Genesis chapter 38. 37 ends with telling us that Jacob is really sad that Joseph has been um, taken to slavery or been killed because he assumes he's been killed. But then Judah's story is inserted in chapter 38. And chapter 38 of Genesis begins with Judah leaving his family, leaving Jacob, leaving his brothers, and he goes to live in Abdullam. Now, just like many of you guys, I'm assuming a lot of you aren't from Berrien Springs. Wherever you've come from, California, Calcutta, whatever corner of the world God has brought you to Andrews for, just like Judah, you took a journey. And just like Judah, some of you guys are going to find your wives here. Um, Judah went to Abdullam and he found his wife. And that is the first thing we're told about his story. And with his wife, he has three children, three sons. The first name is Er, the second name is Onan, and the third is Shela. So Judah has these three sons with his wife. And when Er, the firstborn, becomes of age, Judah goes and finds him a wife. And so this wife's name is Tamar. So Judah, I'm sure, is happy. Er and Tamar are married. His firstborn is married and happy. But then the Bible tells us something bad happens. Er is killed because he is wicked in the sight of the Lord. Bam, Er is dead. And so Judah, he still has two sons, and Tamar is now a widow. He tells his secondborn son, Onan, Onan, marry marry Er's widow that he left behind because this is our culture. You need to take care of her. So this is where the Bible gets really disgusting and gross if you're familiar with the story in Genesis chapter 38. Because we're told that Onan, Judah's secondborn, while married to Tamar, he has sex with her. But every time before he's about to inseminate her, he pulls out of her. And because of that, the Lord sees him as wicked and bam, Onan is dead too. So now Er has married Tamar and he dies. Onan married Tamar and he dies. And Judah is left with one last son. Now what he should do is give Shelah to marry Tamar because that's their culture. But Judah thinks to himself and he's like, hold on, something's going on here. I gave my first son to be married to this woman and he died. My second son married this woman and he died. I only have one left, what should I do? So Judah devises a plan. He says, Tamar, come here, my lovely. You are my daughter-in-law still, even though you've basically killed my two sons. But it's okay. Um, You know what I'm going to have you do? Go live with your parents for a little bit. Shayla, he's still like, you know, in high school or whatever. He's still younger. I want to, you know, make sure he's a man so he can provide for you. I'll I'll bring him to you when he's older. But you go live with your parents, okay? Go go do that, okay? So Judah sends his daughter-in-law Tamar away. Some time passes, a few years pass, and Judah's own wife dies. Now Judah, after he's mourned the death of his own wife, he takes a journey to where the sheep shearers are. That's all the Bible tells us. Judah takes a journey. And along the way, he sees a woman wrapped up. I guess back in the day, prostitutes kind of wrapped up instead of the opposite. But anyway, he sees a woman wrapped up, and he assumes she's a prostitute because she looked like one on the road. And Judah Judah says to the prostitute, I mean, I don't know how he hollered. I don't know how he spit game. I don't know how he convinced her to get into bed with him. But somehow he's like, hey, can I get your number, whatever. And the woman is like, you know what? We can sleep together because she was playing this role of the prostitute. But she's saying, "Um, how do I know you're going to pay me? Because you have to pay me because I'm a prostitute. You're paying for sex. And 
He's like, I owe you. Can I just pay you later? She's like, how will I know you'll come back and pay me? So Judah's like, well, how about I give you something that's distinctly mine? So what he gave her is his seal, his cord, and his staff. And I would think it's kind of like the equivalent of maybe giving someone your Andrew's ID card. Like, hey, let's sleep together. I owe you. I need this to eat in the calf. So <laughs> let me give you... <laughs> Let me give you my ID card, and you use it, you know, you hold on to it, but I promise I'll come back and pay, and then we'll exchange, you know? So that's what they did. So Judah, Judah exchanged his, like, his, what he had to identify himself for sex. And so sometime later, time passes, and Judah's like, man, I need to pay that prostitute. Like, you know, he's a good guy. He pays his prostitutes. And so... Um, so, Judah sends his friend, though, because he doesn't want to go himself. Judah sends his friend, and he's like, dude, take the goat. Like, we need to take the goat to pay her. Go find the prostitute. But his friend goes back to the place where the prostitute should have been, and he's asking everyone, where's the prostitute that was sitting here on the side of the road? And everyone's like, dude, there was no such prostitute that's ever been sitting on the side of the road. And Judah's friend comes back to him and is like, Judah, I went and tried to pay the prostitute. She's not there. And Judah's like, well, you know what? We could push it, but then people might find out. I slept with a prostitute. Let's just not push it. I'll keep, I'll keep it. I'll keep the payment, and she'll keep my staff, and then I'll just go get a new ID card made at the ad building or whatever. <laughs> so what happens next is very, very interesting because three months later, Judah hears word that his daughter-in-law has become pregnant due to harlotry. And so Judah is like, oh, his his first reaction, I love this in the story, because I feel like oh, sometimes I'm like Judah. You know, you've done something wrong, but when someone else does something wrong, you want to get really angry about it. So Judah's like, oh, bring her out here to be burned to death. Like, he, I can see it on his face. He's like, my daughter-in-law is pregnant? What? I didn't give her Shayla, so there's no reason she should be sleeping with a man. She's technically a widow. And so I can imagine Tamar taking the long journey to Judah's house. And I can imagine her, as any good woman would, you know, rubbing her belly. As she walks into the room with Judah across there and everybody, all the family gathered around. And Judah's like, what do you have to say for yourself? You are pregnant. You're not married to Shayla. And as she stands before him, she's like, okay, as any good woman would. I know you want to burn me and everything. And that's, you know. But um, before you do, before you light the fire, um, can you tell me who, who this belongs to? Because... He might have an idea of why I'm pregnant. <laughs> I mean, you guys say the Bible is not interesting. I literally laughed out loud. Like, I was like, this is not real life. But it was. But it was. So I'm sitting here looking at the story, and I'm like, what is going on in the Bible? But then I read, and the story, after that confrontation, Judah accepts responsibility for what he's done. He says, okay. I slept with her. I shouldn't have done that. She is more righteous than he. That's what the Bible tells us in Genesis 38. So we're told this, and I'm like, okay, Jesus, I see. You've given Judah a new identity. Like he sleeps with a prostitute, and then he admits he's wrong. Okay, I guess that's enough for him to be called the, Jesus to be called the lion of the tribe of Judah. You're telling us to repent. But then I realized that Judah's story does not end in Genesis chapter 38. No, it doesn't. It actually continues in Genesis 44. Now here's the thing. Judah and Tamar, that's done business. Judah has, Tamar gives birth to two twins, right? But Judah returns to his family, to his brothers, and where his father Jacob is living. And the thing is, as you guys know the story of Joseph, there's a famine in the land. And Judah and his brothers have to go to Egypt to get food. Now here's where the story gets really, really interesting, okay? The brothers are forced to take two trips to Egypt, but... They don't recognize that Joseph is the ruler that is giving them food. And Joseph complicates their trips because he's trying to test to see, are these the same brothers that sold me to slavery years ago? And if they are, man, I should just give them a really hard test and, you know, and just make their life miserable because they sold me to slavery all these years ago. And he's starting to see these brothers aren't exactly the same guys that he remembers from years ago. But here's the thing. This is where the true climax of the story is. Joseph, who's posing as an Egyptian ruler, tries to test his brothers one last time, we're told in Genesis 44. 
Now, he does this by, they came to pay with money, they came to buy the food for the famine with money, but he puts their money back in their sacks, and then he also adds a silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And whoever stole from these Egyptian rulers, they were supposed to be put to death, or at least imprisoned. But they all denied it because Joseph has his men follow after his brothers. His brothers are like headed out of town and his men are like, how could you? The king was so kind to you. How could you steal from the king? Now, Benjamin is supposedly the one who stole from the king, right? Because he had the cup in his bag. But in Genesis 44, verses 18 through 32, this shows us a lengthy plea by Judah. Judah explaining why he wants to lay his life down for his brother. He wants to take the punishment for Benjamin. He's like, you can't keep Benjamin here in Egypt. It would kill my father. He's already lost another son. I know this, if he lost Benjamin, the other son he loved, it would just absolutely kill him. Now, Judah insists on taking Benjamin's place, which shows us what? Judah. Judah had a change of heart. Judah offered his life in place for his brothers. And Jesus offered his life in place for us. I was, oh man, oh man, that just makes me sigh every time I think about it because I'm like, that is so, uh, let me keep reading my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Judah was actually a foreshadowing of who Christ was going to be years, years later. Judah never met Christ, right? Because Jesus Christ hadn't yet come. But Judah knew Christ. Judah knew Christ. Judah's identity was not in what he did. It wasn't in him selling Joseph to slavery. It wasn't in sleeping with Tamar, the prostitute, who he thought was a prostitute but was actually his daughter-in-law. But either, any way you tell that story, it's still disgusting. But anyway, um, <laughs> Judah, when presented with an opportunity from God to choose to display the love of Christ, he, he took that opportunity. You see, Judah's identity before this incident was very terrible. All we know about him is he was trying to make money off his brother. He slept with this prostitute. I mean, that's, you guys, that's huge. He slept with a prostitute. But because he asked himself, what would Jesus do? Or what would God do? He was able to put his life down for his brother. This is true identity. To know Christ and the sacrifice of giving yourself for someone else. And it may not be as dramatic as giving your life for a fellow student here on campus, but we can show Christ's love to each other. All of us, I see, are kind of types of Judah. I see it personally with myself. I remind myself of the things I've done. Maybe they're not as bad as, as this, this story is, but we remind ourselves of our identity and we kind of define ourselves by our sin. But Christ is calling us out of that. You see, we look at each other and we judge each other based on the things that we've done in the past or the different identities that we've created, like who's cooler than each other, who dresses nicer, who sings better, who, who does whatever better. But the thing is, when you guys were looking at this image at the beginning, you guys looked at this image and you laughed and you're like, why is she doing this? This is so weird. But you probably thought you're really different from Lil Wayne. Besides the million, $100 million, you probably looked at that picture and you're like, I am not at all like that guy. I'm in chapel. I'm week, in a week of prayer. I'm going to knock out my chapel credits. I love Jesus, you know, regularly. And, <laughs> and you looked at the guy and you're like, I'm not that guy. But every time we seek to promote self, every time we don't let love others the way Christ loves us. Every time we are building our own identity and just trying to get more and more for me, me, me. We are just like him. I mean, and we're just like Judah before Jesus. And we're just like every other person in the past who has just lived for themselves. We all have our dark. You have yours, I have mine. We all have the sins that we've committed. But this is what you need to know. God, all God requires of you is just for you to say yes. He presents opportunities to us every day, in the calf, in the dorm, to just hold the door for someone, smile at someone, show someone Christ's love in the little ways. And all God requires from us is just for us to say yes. The thing that excites me about the story of Judah, like I said, is I feel like sometimes I'm really similar to him. And 
We all are in, in some way or another. But what's more exciting than the way we're similar to him as far as his sin is that God can use us similarly just like he used Judah. And we see that because if you turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 3, you see that Judah actually ends up being the 39th great-grandfather of Jesus himself. And not only that, in Revelation 5, verse 5, we're shown that Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, the thing about Jesus' identity is that it's not always easy. But one thing is you have to know is that you won't go it alone. You will be given God's strength himself in order to fulfill this mission of loving one another. And it's not always easy. It's not always easy to love. But that's what Christ calls us to do. The place we see Christ's identity best displayed is, you guys know it, and I'm standing on it, but it's on the cross. That's where we see Christ's identity most best displayed. And Christ's identity seems a little bloody, but guess what? I want a bloody identity. I want to be known for love. I want to follow in Christ's footsteps. Christ is willing to exchange with us our terrible identities for his, and that thought alone should make you all smile. Why choose God? Because he is identity. Don't hold on to yours. It's, no matter how good it looks, it's still really, really, really pathetic compared to God's that he wants to give you. When I think of God, his identity, the cross, the blood, the bloodiness, the fact that I want a bloody identity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there is a hymn that comes to mind, and I really want us all to sing it if you guys would. Um, it starts, there is a fountain filled with blood. And so if you would join me in singing just one verse of that, let's sing together and then I'll pray, okay? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's and sinners born. Dear God in heaven, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the fact that even all of us sitting here can follow in the steps of Judah and Christ as well and offer our lives as a bloody sacrifice for you. Thank you so much for your blood that cleanses us of all our guilty stains because we all have them. Lord, I pray that during this week of pray, prayer, you help us to critically think about that question, why choose God? Why choose God? Because you are our identity. Thank you so much. Amen. <clears throat> awesome message, amen. All right, so guys, the next time we're going to be seeing you is tonight at 7.30 uh, for our next chapter in Week of Prayer. At 7.30 tonight, Aaron Perkypile will be speaking. Uh, so come out tonight at 7.30. We'll see you then. He's right down here, bald guy. Um, and we'll see you tonight. All right, other than that, stay warm. Uh, have an awesome day.